This is my Range Rover. There are many like it, but this one is mine. Since being built in Solihull just 10 years ago, she will soon have travelled a distance equal to that between the Earth and the Moon. She may be a far cry from the original landmark design of 1970, but she still carries that legendary DNA that has survived the passage of time better than any steel or alloy could. To me, a Range Rover is more than a car, more than a brand, and I'm not alone. The Land Rover community is the greatest of its kind anywhere in the world, all over the world. We're a diverse family of like-minded individuals, united by our passion for these uniquely special cars. And that passion can be felt no better anywhere than here on YouTube. Hello, Sam. Hello, Ben. How are you doing? Not too bad. How are you doing? Yeah, good. Good stuff. Yeah. Cameras are rolling. Yeah, we're all set up here. <laughs> cool. You guys can see the first part of this video on Ben's channel where he was asking me questions. In this part, I'm asking Ben questions that were sent in by you guys, the viewers. So sit back and enjoy. Uh, yeah, so questions for Ben now. Um, so first lot going to be sort of car related, Range Rover related questions. Um, same and similar ones to you've asked me, so we're going to get your perspective now. Um, so how and when did you first become interested in Range Rovers is the first question. Um, that would have been the first garage I worked at. I did my apprenticeship uh, back in 1993. Um, we used to have three Range Rovers come in. We had a uh, an A Reg, three and a half litre petrol, um, a 1988, I think that was a three and a half, that was automatic. So obviously they were customers' cars, so we got to work on them and actually driving them. You know, when you sort of like, I must have been about 18 at the time, uh, and they just felt special. All the cars we had in the garage, you'd, you'd test drive them, or we used to run the customers back home in their own cars. Uh, and I used to drive these Range Rovers, and they just felt special. Um, yeah. It was. I, I don't know exactly know, what you mean there. There's something about even like the old classics. They they felt you felt sort of different driving them. I don't know why, but because you sat you sat higher up, and it's. It, it's not. It wasn't a snobby, snobbery type thing, but it was sort of like, if you've driven one, you'll know. Yeah. You'll know what I mean. But yeah, it's hard. It's hard to explain, isn't it? The, the, like exactly what you say. Yeah. You, you're not. You're not like. It's not like you're looking down on everybody. Although you, I guess you physically are looking down on people from. Well, this is this is back in the day when the the regular cars that were coming into the garage, we wasn't getting any sort of modern stuff. So sort of like ninety three, ninety four ish. We was getting sort of like late 70s uh, in through the 80s so it was things like um ford escorts cortinas and uh, morris miners we had a couple of hyundai's we a hyundai stella hyundai pony this was when hyundai were like really rubbish <laughs> i can't even picture what those look like but i imagine they're not that great and we had a couple of Skoda Estelles, regular customers, you know, the 120s with the engine in the boot, and they were just awful. You know, you get driving them, and they were just, and then you jump into these Range Rovers, and it was just something, it was a different world, and it's, it's sort of like, Joe, you know what, I really like these cars. And um, just over the years, I've always had Range Rovers. I have had a Land Rover at one point, but I never got it on the road, um, and I swapped that back in for a Range Rover. So that's pretty much where yeah. my my sort of love of Range Rovers started with the like the old classics, through yeah. the, through to the P thirty eight, which we had one of, and then we got the TD six, and now we're in the TD V eight, and you know, yeah. every sort of step has been a bit of an upgrade sort of thing, but they've always sort of retained that sort of special feel when you're driving them. Yeah, it's um, 
it's definitely carried on throughout the generations, isn't it? The same same feeling you get when you get down the road in one. Yeah, yeah. But it's, uh, when I'm driving the TDV8, I, I still think that if I jumped into a classic now, I'd still get that feeling, sort of. But I don't know what it is, because the, the interior of the classics, so they're so basic and outdated now, but they have got a, a special sort of feeling about them. And I, I think that's why I've sort of taken to Range Rovers. But, you know, because over my sort of career in the motor trade, I've sort of, I've driven a lot of cars, uh, but always come back to the Range, always, always come back to the Range Rover. Yeah, it's that same thing, isn't it? Once, once you get uh, bitten, you never go back. And that kind of leads me on to the next question. So in an alternate universe where you couldn't have a Range Rover, so imagine Range Rover was, wasn't a thing, what, what would you have instead? It's a tricky one, but I've, I think I probably would say um, one of the older Land Cruisers. Yeah. Uh, with a 4.2 turbo diesel, six cylinder. Um, yeah, that's a good shout. I, I did work at a, um, it was a, a Daihatsu garage that they used to be Toyota and um, the boss's son used to run, it was called Four Counties 4x4 and that was sort of like a 4x4 four by, four by four accessory um, shop and um, it, his customers used to buy the stuff and bring it into the garage to have it all fitted so the ramp that I had in the workshop was the only one that you could fit Land Cruisers on so I got to, to, to fit all the goodies on Land Cruisers and you know we used to have customers come in that were doing road trips to Africa and all that kind of stuff. So they'd buy all the, the stuff from four counties. It'd come into the workshop and then I'd have to fit all the stuff. And it, it, it was nearly always sort of new Land Cruisers, which was, you know, really nice to work on. Um, I can't remember what, because I'm not a Land Cruiser sort of fan. I, I, I don't know what all the series numbers are, but it's, is it the 100 series, the, the biggest one? Um, uh, yeah, 100's like, uh, I think that's sort of um, about 1999 onwards, or 98 onwards, that sort of era. Um, 80 series is the one that came before that. Yeah, and then they, they still, you could still get the, the square v version, I don't know what series that was. was um, uh, yeah, 70 series. That's that's the kind of like one that looks a bit like a Defender, sort of an old, old, older truck sort of style. I think if I didn't, if I couldn't have a Range Rover, it would be a nicely sorted out Land Cruiser. Cool. Yeah, that's a good that's a good shout actually. I, I, I didn't really think about Land Cruisers when I answered, but yeah, that's not a bad shout. Money no object. What Range Rover would you buy today, or Range Rovers? Um, I think I'd probably have to go the like, same route that you said buy a brand new top of the range yeah. autobiography um yeah just for bimbling about in <laughs> having said that um i've i don't know if it'd be too mental but is it the uh, the svr yeah there's a sport svr i was considering one of them when i when i answered as well but like you say a bit mental i'm i'm, I'm a bit more of a cruise around in comfort kind of guy i'm, I'm not saying that i'm getting old but you know i I'm, I'm, I've, I've done the fast stuff because I've had the motorbikes and that and I'm, I'm getting to that level now where I'm happy pottering around on the tractor and, and and cruising around in the Range Rover so I think it would probably be like a top of the range Range Rover um, yeah. the best that money could buy basically uh, yeah. and then a, an account at the filling station yeah, <laughs> yeah a lifetime supply of diesel yeah <laughs> Then uh, let's go with car heaven and hell then. So what's your idea of car heaven, like car you'd love or you'd love to own, and car hell and cars that you hate and that you would never want to own? Um, now, I've always said that the car that I would most like to own and would be the, the thing that I always wanted would be a Range Rover, but I've already got one of those, so that's sort of out of the, <laughs> that's off, off the cards, isn't it? Um, I think the car that I like the look of the most and I've worked on a couple and is an old E-type Jag. Um, yeah. I just like the look, I like the look of them. Um, 
not I don't like the hard top version like the coupe I think that looks like a out of shape water balloon <laughs> but I like the I like the convertible and also I've seen a couple now uh, do they call it resto mod um, where they they take the old cars and they bring them up to date with new technology uh, I've, I've seen a couple of resto mod e-type jags and they look absolutely stunning yeah that'd be great wouldn't it actually yeah a great looking old car like that that's actually got the modern technology of a you know a modern sports car obviously i'd want a nice automatic gearbox in it because <laughs> uh, my left leg doesn't work quite as well as my right leg all oh, right okay yeah that's what you mean <laughs> I'm, I'm all right on the tractor i can i can do the clutch on the tractor but i think that's because i'm sort of sat up the seat position on the tractor you're sort of sat up so you're pushing down with your leg but whereas in, yeah. in the car, I've tried driving the Panda and sat in the car, I can't push down with my leg. So what I have to end up doing is put my hand on my knee and push my leg down with my, ne <laughs> with my hand. <laughs> oh, I see. Yeah. But if, if yeah, I was... If it, nice yeah, if it was a nice resto mod E-Type, you know, I'd get them to put a nice, you know, a trick automatic gearbox in it. Uh, and what about uh, car hell? car hell well it's a tricky one i could say just to upset the hobbit indoors i could say um the fiat panda <laughs> but try at the end of the day the panda <clears throat> i know i won't be getting my t dinner tonight now will i <laughs> um right for um gonna move on to some general questions now um so my first one for you is how long have you lived in france what made you want to leave the UK and go to live in France? And would you recommend it to other Brits who were thinking about it? Right. Well, I came out to France in June 2009. Um, basically, I, I was married and I you know, split up. And um, my parents were already living out here. And so I'd, yeah. le I'd, I'd moved out of the house. And I was sort of lodging with a friend for about a year. Uh, and just out of the blue one day, he said, oh, when are you thinking of moving? <laughs> but that's a bit, bit of a hint. So um, I says, well, you know, it, it all came to, to sort of pass. And I said, right, next week. So I phoned my mum and dad. I said, you know, is it all right if I come over? My dad had plenty of work on at the time. So um, they said, yeah, come over whenever. So I packed in work. I took my car in for an MOT on the Sunday. And by Wednesday, I was in France, and I've never looked back. <laughs> um, would I recommend it? Uh, yeah, basically. I mean, to me, when we were growing up as kids, we, we was obviously living in Kent. We all come from Kent. We, we moved up to Lincoln. Yeah. We moved up to Lincolnshire when I was about seven. It was a different world moving from Kent to Lincolnshire because there was yeah. there was no traffic on the roads uh everybody spoke differently you know if the, if you, if you come across someone with a broad lincolnshire accent you you thought they were speaking a different language so it yeah. it was just like a totally different world yeah I, I, don't, I don't want to be i don't want to be mean you know i don't want to offend anybody who's from the area of kent but i'd, I'd say like the no north part of kent isn't exactly the nicest the nicest part of the world is it? <laughs> it's a bit no not bit. not really now I liken moving to France to being the, similar to when we moved to Lincolnshire. So coming from the UK to France, it's that same sort of thing. It's a totally different world. There's there's less yeah. there's less traffic. Obviously, they all speak a different language over here. <laughs> yeah. Um, but if if it's just as out here in rural France, it's a different way. You know, it's a totally different pace of life. Um, yeah. it, everything sort of slowed right down and you know nobody's in a rush to do anything yeah that's, that's what you always notice as a Brit when you go to France is how uh, nobody's in a rush it can be a bit annoying sometimes kind of when you when you want to get something done but I think in general that's a good way to live isn't it when you're less less stress yeah. uh, it definitely it definitely appeals to me to go over to France I, I think I just mentioned it earlier on like I go there under normal circumstances quite often and um, it has always appealed to me um, I love a lot of things about France, like food and the uh, culture. Um, yeah. So, 
it will definitely be tempting for me at some point. What YouTube channels do you follow or enjoy on, on the platform? Well, I obviously follow your channel. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> um, I mean, I've, I'm subscribed to quite a few channels, but I, I do find myself sort of watching the same ones. Um, I, I used to watch a lot of farming YouTube channels. Yeah, same here. But what I, what I found with the farming channels, after you've been through them, sort of followed them for a year, the next year they're just repeating all the same stuff again. <clears throat> and it, it sort of, you're just watching the same stuff over and over again, apart from the presenters just get, the presenters just getting a bit older. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, the cycling sort of yeah, farming, isn't it? But, you know, yeah, I mean, there's obviously nothing that they can do about it. That's their job and that's that's their channel. But um, I just, yeah. so I was watching a lot of farming channels, um, but motoring wise, I watch um, obviously your channel, Harry's Garage. Um, yeah. He has some nice that's cars on. I also watch Harry's Farm. Um, yeah. That's, he comes up with some really interesting stuff on there. Obviously, we're not farmers, but we've got quite a bit of land and we, we do bits and pieces. We've got a tractor, so I feel like a farmer. <laughs> uh, but he, 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 he goes through stuff like, um, you know, the emissions that cows are putting out and he, he debunks what the BBC are, are telling everybody in the world. And I think if more people watched Harry's Farm and educated themselves more on what goes on at the farming level um so yeah I, I watch harry's garage harry's farm uh occasionally i watch hubnut um yeah. some of his not I, i've sort of gone away from him a little bit now um i think he stopped doing range rover content hasn't he he doesn't do as much range rover stuff now maybe he sold it no <laughs> no and uh, it's I don't, I don't. I mean, some of the stuff I do in the garage is on par with what he does, which I I shouldn't. It, I'm you know being a mechanic, it, <laughs> I should know better. But uh... <laughs> so the next question I had was about your occupation or your profession. Um, what what uh, have you trained in? What's your your profession? Uh, well, basically, I trained as a mechanic. Obviously, like what they used to call it. Light, uh, light vehicle and commercial vehicles. When I, when I, I t did my apprenticeship, um, and when I started, it was all city and guilds. But then MV, they started yeah. they started doing MVQs. So I sort of did half a city and guilds, half an MVQ type thing, which was a bit odd. Yeah. But um, so yeah, I did obviously my uh, my day release uh, one one day a week at college, <coughs> and. Um, you know, I did, did my apprenticeship at a little family garage in the out in the sticks in Lincolnshire. Um, yeah, it, it was fantastic. Cause it, it, we used to restore classic cars, so we used to have all sorts come in. Um, you know, f f stuff from like a 1935 Daimler 15, uh, right the way through to a, a Trans Am, um, and every. Wow. And, and stuff in between. We used to do a lot of Morris Miners. Now, at the time, I used to hate Morris Miners with a passion. Um, but look, but looking back, I don't know why I, ha I hated them so much because, you know, if you're good on the spanners, you can have the engine out in less than an hour. Uh, you know. So next question: uh, When did you start doing YouTube, and what are your long-term goals for the platform? Um, I started on, uh, with an account on YouTube in 2009 and I was sort of like just putting random family stuff on, you know, you do bits and pieces and you put it on YouTube, basically just to to host the video so that I could share it with everybody, you know, share it with the family and stuff. Because um, at the time, sending videos and stuff by email, it was a big no-no because the file sizes were so big, so I was sort of using YouTube to, just to host videos. Um, so that sort of ticked over for a while. I've sort of then put bits and pieces out, sort of 2012 to 14, just random stuff. Uh, then I, 2015, I started putting out like um, some of the machinery that we had, 
when we was doing the, doing the gardening, um, yeah. we had a Ferrari rotavator, which took got, got quite a bit of interest. Uh, basically, it was it was a two wheel tractor, uh, single cylinder di- diesel engine on it. It was a fantastic bit of kit, and I was just putting out just content like that, and um, then I ended up in hospital. And afterwards, I was in the wheelchair, so it was sort of like I just started putting out. We was doing a lot of gardening stuff in and around the old house, growing chilies and all that kind of thing. And I was just putting out videos and stuff. We bought the new, we bought the Audi, and I did a video on that. That got a bit of interest. And then Tina suggested that we bought a proper off-road car for for this new place. And um, so I settled on a Range Rover, as I would. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> naturally. Yeah, and. Um, I put out some Range Rover videos and they just sort of really took off, you know, and I'd already done a, a camp, we'd changed the cam belt on a friend's Toyota Hilux. That was getting a lot of views. And um, and then the Range Rover stuff, it seemed to do, start doing really, really well. So it's, since then, it's, I've just been trying to put out regular content, everything that we get doing in the garage now. Obviously the garage isn't finish, finished yet. That's another project, but... <laughs> This is a subject we we talked about previously. Um, the um, the fact that the Range Rover videos seem to be really popular on YouTube. Um, it's just we're not quite sure what it what it is, are we? But it's it seems to be there's just like a lot of there's a lot of you guys enthusiasts out there that that love Range Rover content, and that, you know the more we make, it seems like the more you guys watch it. So, um, but it's just not it's not quite the same for all types of cars or or you know other other topics is it it seems to be just that Range uh, Rover stuff it, it, for, for, especially for my channel it the Range Rover stuff gets the views basically um, if I do a video on the Audi or or the Panda um, the, they get watched but nowhere near as much but at the end of the day I, I enjoy the filming and I enjoy the editing process and that and uh, basically it, it keeps me quiet so yeah it's it's nice to have the you know the high view counts and and the like all the comments and everything but like you say it's the process of filming editing that i think we both enjoy and um yeah. it doesn't it doesn't really matter what your topic is you know um it's still the same enjoyment you get from it isn't it so um, that kind of leads me on to another question which is apart from range rovering what are your other hobbies and interests now i know you've got some other youtube channels that you you cover some of them with so yeah, I, I'll say the other two channels I've got is Mad Dog Air Guns I mean, and uh, the Mad Dog Farm. Um, we called this place the Mad Dog Farm because we've got, obviously, two stupid dogs. Um, oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, and I, I thought it just had a bit of a ring to it. And um, So, obviously, the air guns, that's sort of like all the air gun stuff. Um, so, I, I quite enjoy a bit of shooting and that target shooting. I'm not into shooting game or anything like that um just target shooting um i'm not against shooting all that kind of thing but that's just not for me uh but other hobbies um music is a big part um obviously i would say i'm fairly proficient at bass guitar (laughs) not i wouldn't say i'm i'm the best i'm not a you know one of these that is like absolutely fantastic i can i can play most songs um, I could play a bit of the keyboards as well, um, and I've got a drum kit which I am sort of learning. Um, and somewhere tucked away, I've got a saxophone which I was learning to play the saxophone before I went into hospital, and I was actually picking, I was picking it up quite well. And you know, I was getting back into reading music again, which you know I thought that was going to be difficult, um, but I've not really got back into that since coming out of hospital. So. Have you have you thought about doing um, uh, music on YouTube? You know, doing um, bass lessons or, or something to do with your your musical talents on YouTube. So that could be quite popular. Oh, I've I thought about maybe just doing some like cover songs with, on the bass and that just sort of play alongs and stuff or or something like that. I'd watch it. I don't think I'm. I don't think I'd ever do like any sort of tutorials or anything like that because at the end of the day, I'm not that good. Um, <laughs> I was into photography in a big way, but that the video side of it sort of taken over a bit from that. I'd, I, do, I do still take a lot of photos, but um, 
not as much as I used to. Um, so other than, other than that, it's pottering around on the farm and uh, cooking, quite like a bit of cooking. Okay then, so another question from a guy called South Africa 786 He says, Ben, what's happening with the TD6? Are you planning on making any more videos? Would be great. Uh, the TD6, it's still sat there. <laughs> Uh, it's st it's still in bits. Um, I, I was having an hour on what to do with it. There was a chap that was interested in buying it, um, and he was going to come and fix it. Apparently, he ordered the parts to fix it, um, but I've not heard from him since then. Uh, <laughs> so, because I've got these other little jobs to do in the garage at the minute, like the Audi and the Panda, once I can get the get onto that Range Rover. If I'm going to get in touch with the bloke who's interested in it. If he's not in if he doesn't want it anymore, I'll fix it and and then start using it, do some videos with it and um we may end up keeping it because it doesn't owe us anything. Um it still runs. At one point you said you might be interested in making it into like a sort of overlanding expedition type vehicle. Yeah, I mean that was that was the plan. Um Obviously, it's got this gearbox issue. It still drives perfectly. Um, it just judders a little bit in fifth gear, which I, I believe is the torque converter. Um, but it's still going. And until warning lights start flashing up, you know, saying trans safe or whatever it is on the dashboard that pops up, um, I'll probably I'll probably just keep going with it. Um, but say if we do keep it, I would probably I would rather come sort of modify the TD6 for off-roading rather than the TDV8. Um, only because the TDV8 at the moment is a nice car. It's <laughs> it's still fairly low mileage. Uh, and I know what will happen. I'll start off-roading it and I'm going to go past a load of bushes and scratch all the paintwork up. Um, whereas with the TD6, we picked it up cheap. It doesn't owe us any money. That's, that's, kind, of, that's kind of why... Um... I got the one that I bought the car I did because because the paintwork and the bodywork's not in you know first class condition anymore. Um, when when I actually do yeah. end up using it off road, um, it won't feel so bad. If you know what I mean, it won't feel so bad if I scratch it or scrape it. Um, whereas on yeah. whereas on your TDV, it's obviously that that much shinier and cleaner and fresher that you wouldn't want to uh, yeah. yeah ding it up. Uh, so yeah, Neil White's question is quite a good one. Um, what three mods would you recommend or plan on doing to make the vehicle better? I think obviously it'd be the same as you. Tires, it's all about the tires. Um, these cars are so capable off-road with all the technology on them, and um, I mean, this one has got a locking rear diff, which I know was an optional extra on a lot of models. Yeah, that that's a lovely that's a lovely um, spec to have. I wish mine had that. Yeah, but I mean they've all got the traction control. They've all got the terrain response. Um, the, the video that I did off-roading around our field, the one thing that let it down was the tyres. Right, I'm, I'm on uh, Continental all-weather road tyres, which are fantastic on the road. You get it on wet grass and it is, you know, wet grass going uphill, you've got no hope. Um, so I think if I was to mod this car, the first thing I would probably do was is the tyres. Second thing, I, along the same lines that you said, the EGR valves. Um, before we bought this, I was doing a lot of um, researching and that, which was the best to get. And what kept cropping up was EGR valves on these 3.6 TDV8s because it's twin turbo. You've got two EGR valves. When they fail, they let um, coolant into the in inlet and really mess about. Uh, so, I've actually had them physically blocked and deleted from the ECU. The way that I see it, if a car is, if it's got an EGR valve, it's like a car trying to run on its own fart. <laughs> that's, that, that's the way I've sort of see it in my head. It, it's like trying to run on its own fumes, and you know, obviously, running on fresh air is going to be better. And as for the third mod. Ooh, I don't know really. Uh, get some decent seat covers in the back for the dogs. <laughs> I quite like those um, those armrest adjusters that you did. I quite I thought that was quite a nice little mod. 
uh, yeah, I'll just I'm just showing them on the camera now. Um, they call them the autobiography. Cool. I might be tempted to to uh, put a set on mine when I've. Um, so I'm changing the seat the seats soon once I go and pick them up, and uh, yeah, once I do that, I might um, might chuck a set on mine as well, brighten the interior up a bit. Yeah, yeah. I mean, because the, the standard ones are just plastic, aren't they? Yeah, that's right. Did, did you know? Did you know? This is a little a little uh, bit of trivia for you. The um, armrests in these cars and the mechanisms um, is exactly the same mechanism and armrest as you find in a transit van. Is it really? <laughs> it's literally the same part, so I don't know why it is. Obviously, it's trimmed in leather on the Range Rover, but um, yeah, if you look at a transit interior, they actually have the same armrest and same uh, same exact knob on the end and everything. So uh, yeah, a bit, bit of trivia for you. Carl Douglas, he says, what are your opinions on the rotary selector versus traditional gear selector? Um, and, and are there any downsides of the TFT dashboard? Well, you'll have to answer the one with the rotary selector because I've never driven a car with one of those. Okay, well, my answer to that is I don't really like it. <laughs> I'd, prefer, I'd prefer a gear stick, to be fair, like a normal uh, automatic selector. All right, that's what we, in the 3.6, we've got the traditional stick. Um, you pull it back in reverse, neutral, in the gears, and then you knock it over for sports, and then if if you start pushing it backwards and forwards, you can then change up and down through the gears as you see fit. Because this car, this car hasn't got paddle shift. Yeah, I mean the, the paddle shift's nice. That's quite fun on this. It's quite good to use it every now and again. Just drop it down a couple of gears. Um, but I, I would actually have, if I had a choice, I would have the stick you've got because I think they look better in the cabin, um, and it's just nicer to use. I think I, I don't. I just don't. I don't see the attraction of the. Um, the rotary selector for some reason I don't, which doesn't do anything for me so if i had a choice i'd go back to the old tiles type stick um and then yeah the tft dash what do you think about that i like it um the td6 has got the old style clocks on it um this one's got the tft dash i've got it on that um the mode that it just lights up where the needles are i don't know what it's called um but like you you yeah, you press yeah that, i think that's it spotlight uh, i've got it set on that and it, it's fantastic and you you know you all your foot when you've got your terrain response it all comes up the, the um the, the speedo and the rev counter set move apart and you've got all your information yeah. comes up in the middle of the dashboard and on the screen on the car um yeah it's just brilliant really oh it's it's never played up and i think it it gives the if because the earlier 3.6 had the old style clocks and I think it when I see them now they look sort of old fashioned yeah but be before I got mine I was a bit worried because because I think this is the very first Land Rover that actually had this type of um, dash in it um, this this generation so I was a bit worried that it wouldn't look very good in person you know that it would look a bit sort of old, dated by now but in actual fact yeah. like you say it looks it looks bang up to date really the, the um, resolution on the screen's really good isn't it and the colors are nice and bright um, so yeah. i think it's yeah it's a nice thing to have with all that extra functionality as well i think it's good so another question this is from david fender um, what diagnostic kit do you use for reading and clearing fault codes well i've got two bits of kit for the land rovers i've got the icarsoft LR version 2 uh, which I bought first um, it, it's quite good it it gets into all the systems all the like the modules on the car uh, reads the codes um, clears the codes you can reset your service intervals and all that kind of thing it will also read any make of car if it's got EOBD on it um, yeah. so that's that's quite good but I've also got the IID gap tool um, specifically for this Range Rover, it's locked to the VIN number on this Range Rover. Um, that you can do everything. You calibrate your suspension. You can you can do absolutely anything that the dealer can do on it. Uh, yeah, I've just I've just picked one of them up as well, so I'm looking forward to uh, having a go on that. But it sounds like it's pretty powerful. From what I've seen, it seems to be able to pretty much do everything that my um, SDD can do, which is which is the JLR. Um, dealer level software 
Um, but obviously the advantage of the IID tool is it's just a dongle that you plug in and then obviously you can use it with your phone or your tablet so you don't need to carry a laptop around with you so um, it's good for just keeping in the car isn't it you can just keep it in the armrest and then yeah I, the I'm just car. yeah I'm just showing it to the camera <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, so. that's it you just you, you just plug that in and Bluetooth to your phone or your your iPad or whatever and that's it brilliant um, yeah, so next question is going to be, uh, what's the biggest adventure you've had in a Land Rover and what trips would you love to do in your current car? I suppose the biggest adventure, it's not quite as adventurous as your tales of Morocco. Um, the biggest adventure for me in a Range Rover was actually moving to France. <laughs> uh, as I was saying to you the other day, I, I had my Range Rover Classic 200 TDI uh, I'd lost first gear. I was towing, I was towing an ex-army Sankey trailer, which was absolutely loaded up to the gunnels. I had a motorbike in there, my snap-on toolboxes. My car was loaded up to the headlining with all my possessions. I'd made a bit of a mistake. I'd put a lift kit on my Range Rover, um, but I got the springs the wrong way round. But what I didn't realise was it was too high for the prop shaft, and. Um, it was putting a lot of wear on the front diff. So the further I got coming down through France, the, the diff was getting louder and louder. And I managed to get it all the way to mum and dad's place with the diff making the most horrendous noise you've ever heard. Uh, <laughs> so the, f the first week I was at, at mum and dad's, I took all the springs off and swapped them round. And uh, it took a bit of pressure off the front diff. It was still a little bit noisy, but it, it kept on going for a little bit. And what about uh, any future any future trips you'd like to do at some point when we're, when we're allowed to, obviously? I mean, I would like to go and do a bit of um, sort of overlanding kind of thing. I mean, there's so many places in France that you can go to, you know, even without leaving the country, which is what the plan was with the TD6, get it sort of converted to like more of an expedition truck where we could yeah. chuck the dogs in the back go anywhere you want camp over somewhere uh, and just have, like have long weekends away sort of thing yeah that's what i was going to say like from your from your position where you are now you know you're pretty close to spain and you know a lot of places in france like the pyrenees that i mentioned earlier um yeah. where you've got like some yeah really cool stuff you can go and go and see not, not too far away yeah, and obviously bring all, yeah. bring the bring the dogs with you and stuff. So yeah, that'd be ideal. The the thing that I the trouble I was get, having getting my head around with the TD6 and sort of converting it for expeditions and having all your gear stowed is the bloody wheelchair. Um, it folds up, but it takes up a lot of room. Um, there is obviously the option of putting it on the roof, but then Tina's got to get it up on the roof and. Um, yeah. Although it's a lightweight wheelchair, it's still quite heavy. Uh, but you could store other stuff on the roof, I suppose, and put the wheelchair in the boot. But it's all options and, you know, something might come of it in the future. Cool. That'd be good. Maybe we can do a, collaborate, a collaborative expedition or little trip somewhere in Europe at some point. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I'll say we'll have to definitely do a bit of a collaboration if you manage to get over to France. Um, you know, we do a video on each other's cars and see what we think of them. Yeah, that'd be cool. <laughs> be good. I have to make sure mine's in tip-top shape then before I get over there. <laughs> yeah. So I hope you guys enjoyed that. I know it was longer than normal, but Ben and I have got a lot to say when it comes to the topic of Range Rovers. This has been mine and Ben's first collaboration, but as we said, we're working on more in the future. Um, apologies if we didn't get round to answering your question, but we'll probably do another one of these in the future or maybe even a live Q&A session next time. Thanks guys, and don't forget to leave a like and a subscribe if you haven't already. Cheers then.